I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, happy event uh, here at IT Delft. In particular, the people who are coming outside, the visitors outside from, from IT Delft and, and Hans's parents are here. So I'm quite happy to, that they are also made it. Uh, my name is uh, Charlotte de Vature. I'm a professor in Land and Water Development, but also the vice rector here in, uh, at IT Delft. Uh, and on behalf of the rectorate, I would like to welcome uh, everybody uh, on this uh, book lounge and uh, marathon, as the people are coming in still. Um, every, on, on, uh, every now and then I get a WhatsApp of my brother, and he is, uh, he's, also in QGI, and he's also in GIS, and, and he's always expressed, he's not IG Delft, but, uh, but, but he's kind of related to, to the GIS world. And every now and then I get this WhatsApp and say, Wow, IT, really, what a convenient power and what, what a great initiative. And uh, so I, I would like also to express uh, my well, admiration to, to Hansel Cross uh, that he has indeed this convenient power and, and this initiative of really pushing open source uh, GIS, QGIS here in the, in the Institute. And the rectorate is fully supporting this, to really push to open source uh, QG, QGIS. Uh, I also would like to uh, congratulate uh, both uh, Hans von Kast and uh, Kurt Menke with, with the book. Uh, I, I already, already have trouble writing just a short article, so I can imagine what it takes to write a book. So, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think I hand it over back to, to Hans uh, for uh, further the elaboration of the, of the program. Thank you. Thank you for the nice words, uh, Charlotte. Really great to see uh, everybody here for the book launch. Uh, we'll have a, a few talks before we get to the official handover of the book. So I will speak a bit and then uh, Port will speak a bit. Um, so we are of course very happy uh, that this book is here now and that we are even in this week using the book in our short course. There are the short course participants are also uh, in the room here. They'll also join the Mapathon later. And they are the first users in the world using this book. Great test for us, always very exciting. And until now it has been very good. They're also very good participants. <laughs> um, but yeah, open source, recipes for catchment, hydrology and water management. It's a bit of a cookbook. I always tell my students that, yeah, if you make the dish of your country, you know, our students come from everywhere in the world. Do you get a cookbook from your mom or your dad, the person who cooks in your house? And often the answer is no, it's just explained. And I said, we make it then exactly the same as your, as the person who teaches you how to make the dish. And then, no, no, we, we give it a twist, a personal twist, a bit more spices, and different vegetables. So that's also what you should do with these kind of books didactically. It has many steps, but the software goes much further and there's where real innovation is. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So here we are at IHC, Institute for Water Education. We are in water management, hydrology, and basically our unit that we use is the, the catchment to understand how flows in the catchment uh, work from the upstream to the downstream. There's also groundwater, relation with uh, vegetation, biology, agriculture, all kinds of things. So the catchment is an interesting unit. The most important chapter in this book is about how to derive from open data, free data available on the internet, uh, a catchment using free tools. So basically you only need capacity, skills. And that's what we work on. But you see a nice example from a fieldwork area where IIT students go in the uh, end of May, beginning of June. And this is made in QGIS, the 3D viewer. And it's uh, open data from EGM draped over an elevation model. I try not to use too many technical terms for people who are not into GIS. But then what does open mean? The concept of open needs to be explained because it's not just that you can have something for free it goes further the concept of open means that you're also free to reuse it for your own purposes that you can redistribute it that you can add services on it and the only limitation that we put on an open license is to we can ask people to attribute to the source that's important in academia we want to be acknowledged for when we make uh, intellectual property and that people share it in the same way, share alike. You can put that on the license. Here you see some pictures. We do at IHE a lot of open educational resources. 
you go to gisopencourseware.org, you can find our uh, free GIS courses. And there's the Open Water Network, where my colleague uh, Anne van Grinsven is uh, very active to connect <laughs> people in uh, working in water uh, that deal with uh, open source modeling and data. And uh, we organize workshops around the world. Uh, what's then the difference between open source and proprietary software? Because in our field, it's very, uh, there's a very famous other package that is uh, proprietary software, but you can't do the same things as with open source. Because <coughs> open source gives you support from the community. <coughs> There's no cost of the license, but that's maybe not the best reason to use it. What's the best reason to use it is optimal interoperability. Difficult word, but it means that it connects to other software that other people develop and to open data and you can integrate things better. You don't have to buy the product from one single company and then add on. And we all know that from uh, if you buy uh, Mac stuff, iPhone, then you need to buy everything from that brand. That's not the case with open source. It relies therefore on open standards and for academia very important. We can peer review the code and we can contribute to that because it's openly shared. We can have the whole source code of uh, QGIS on our laptop and check it if you can read the code. So new developments are quicker implemented because there's a big community contributing to the code base. Obviously the proprietary many things are opposite. You need to call the vendor have a license cost, you pay for support, they try to lock you in their software and uh, mostly they use protected formats that we cannot open in other software, while with open source we use uh, standards. It can't be peer reviewed, so you're relying on the people who make the code and uh, they're generally slower with implementing new features, although people might think that it's the opposite. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about my open source journey. That's not really the journey uh, Kurt, uh, Sarah and I made uh, this weekend, uh, there's always a big hydrology climate tour that I make uh, for visitors, visiting uh, Kinderdijk with the water bus and then uh, watching the windmills at Kinderdijk and then do a hydrological climate tour in Rotterdam to look at climate adaptation. That's another type of journey, but it started for me all around 2003, I think Raymond, uh, for, uh, he's here in the room, still remembers, because we were sharing the office around that time, uh, both doing PhD. And uh, I started learning uh, more advanced things with PC Ruster. It's a, it's a dynamic uh, GIS for, uh, for modeling. And uh, they were moving it to Python and to make it to go to open source completely. And uh, I also learned about GDOM for comfort. A lot of technical things, but there it started. And then when I moved to uh, the Flemish Institute for Technological Research, we had this great team of young researchers that gathered once in a while to discuss things that we could do with Python and to move the whole organization from MATLAB to Python and to do great things with that. Very inspiring. We produced a lot of help to each other, uh, a lot of uh, things shared, good spirit. And uh, in 2013, I came here at IHE and uh, started uh, developing the curricula. Of course, first with the, the traditional software and then moving uh, stepwise to open source. And uh, the next batch, all our students will be in uh, module two uh, exposed to uh, open source GIS. GIS. Later they can choose, but at least they know that open source exists and what they can do with it. And it took some years before I became more active in the QGIS community. And the court will sure uh, talk a bit more about the community, but I went to a hackfest, a so-called hackfest in Nodebo in Denmark, where um, I met the people who make the software and people who also are the community. It's a big family. Literally, because you can come even with your family there to, uh, to enjoy the environment and to uh, work on improving the software, which is not only coding, it's also documenting translations in many languages. So you just available in many more languages. The court will talk more about it, it should be short on that. Um, then in 2018, I asked the uh, court to uh, be, uh, be here in IHE as a guest lecturer, the same course as we are giving uh, this week. And then the seed was planted for an idea to make a book. Uh, on the QGIS for hydrolo hydrological applications. Um, but we made it more concrete, it took until March, um, should be 2019 by the way, uh, sorry, March 2019, where we were in the uh, QGIS Hackfest in uh, Spain, in A Coruña, and uh, there we really gave it a start. And uh, got in touch with Locate Press, with Gary Sherman, who is uh, the inventor of uh, QGIS, and very nice to work with him and, uh, and produce this uh, beautiful book. And there I also made two plugins in, in Spain for hydrology, I'll show some examples. And uh, yeah, now 2019, we have all the students of IHE into open source GIS as a starting point. 
and uh, we also have in terms of educational materials the full range. We have open courseware, completely free, no assistance. We have online courses where people can pay a fee, get some assistance and a certificate. We have the book for if you like to have a book next to your computer, which is very useful if you work with the computer to not have everything as a PDF on your screen. Um, and we have of course our short courses here and we also use the same stuff in the, the modules for the masters. Open source GIS is not only QGIS, but everything works together. So there are lots of other packages to explore, but uh, yeah, QGIS is a bit the integrator of many uh, tools. Under the hood, there's a lot of things and there's organizations. Uh, I'll be short. So what do you learn in the book? Well, we, our focus is a good book, a great book to start with. So it doesn't give you all the advanced options that we can also talk hours about and give lessons in, but what we wanted to start with a good practice book where you learn how to delineate the catchment, import data and uh, georeference maps, how to find open data and other great hobby of mine. Uh, there's a lot of data, I'm sure NSO is going to talk also, maybe a bit about that. Uh, there's a lot around, but many of our uh, people who study here don't know that a lot is around. It's not only the software, it's also the data that we need. Um, and in the end, the book ends with creating a beautiful catchment map. So I'm really looking forward to the next batch who's going to use this book and to finally see really good maps like these ones. QGIS comes with a lot of hydrological tools. They're provided by, uh, by Saga, for example, or Grass for integrates. <coughs> and uh, there was some, uh, some questions on if you want to have the flow direction, typical hydrological thing, the flow direction of water, if you want to visualize that. And um, yeah, in fact, if you want to visualize that, you need a circular gradient because normally the gradients are linear, but north, northeast and northwest are very close together. So you need to not do it linear, but in a circular way. So we integrated that in the book, but in Acarunia, I made a plugin and that was fun. I was inspired by Kurt. He gave a workshop in Acarunia. I followed that and I ended up with this nice video. It's uh, using mesh data. They use it a lot in uh, climate. Uh, winds, uh, hurricanes, uh, very actual, um, to visualize that. So it has different dimensions and it reads uh, special files like uh, GRIP or NetCDF. And I thought, okay, let's connect the two. We have the flow direction from Saga and we have the visualization of the mesh. Can't we visualize flow direction also with these nice beautiful arrow, arrows like also PC Rusters do? And then uh, these guys made that plugin for the mesh and I sat together with them and we together made the new plugin which is available to have flow direction in the form of errors. This is how a Hackfest looks like. It's a so-called unconference, so there's no rules. You just sit there, you come with ideas, there's a, a whiteboard and you meet people you want to meet to make things or to write documentation or to learn about things. So this is uh, an example of how, how that works. So you just get your flow direction map. We show in a bit the interface. So we make this uh, Plug in here, converts it to a mesh, and we drag it from the browser to the map canvas. I'm talking Chinese now for you. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. The colors are nice. The colors are nice. It becomes <laughs> nicer. <laughs> okay, we change some settings in the viewer, and then we get arrows on the map that show the direction of flow of water few simple steps that you could implement just by community work, users engaging with people who make the software to come to great ideas. Well, great, great, small great ideas. Don't make it too big. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks great. So this is the flow of water. And I made another one uh, to uh, calculate uh, catchments for different points. So you feed it with a point file, <coughs> point vector file, and it calculates all the sub catchments. It saves it to a folder. Most of these things are inspired by the students, by the way. Now, what you're going to do in a bit, and Eric uh, will uh, talk more about it, is the Mapathon. We had many Mapathons before, and hopefully we'll have many more during each uh, GIS course. I organized one together with uh, the Red Cross, 510 Global. They're also around today. It's really great. Eric also always helps. And we see here a comparison between Google Maps and OpenStreetMap. In Google Maps, so this is a rural area, and Google is not much interested in rural areas because, yeah. You won't navigate, navigate there with your uh, Google Apps and there are no hotels and restaurants to bring you to when they found out about you through your Gmail. <laughs> so uh, 
no need to map that area. So we do that with our students during a mapathon, and we have this place called the Kesi Maasai area out back in, uh, in Kenya, and people now find themselves on the map. That's very useful, not only for the people living there, but also for humanitarian things. A bit more data around IHE building, the tunnel, all the traffic lights, the building, the water point in front. This is not government data. It's made by citizens like you. And that's what you're going to do today. And it doesn't end there because people in our GIS course today learned how to use that data in QGIS to do analysis. So that data from older Cassie in the Outback, so we can find the place even through the databases, put a point on the map. There we go. We zoom in. The background map is a picture from OpenStreetMap, and we know that everything that's on that picture can be downloaded as vector data, points, lines, and polygons that we can then further use in GIS. So that's a quick OSM plugin that we can use for that. So plugins are written by third party. Many people can contribute to plugins like I did. And we select here some options. We want all the rivers in the area that we zoomed in. It generates a script. You don't have to look at it. You can also simply click run. You don't want to know that. I want to know that. And then we have it. We give it a styling. And there it is. We remove the picture in the background and we see that we have the rivers. There was more blue on that map, but they're not tagged as rivers, maybe as streams or other things. So that's how you can easily get data from things that you're going to map today. Um, I'm going to skip that one. time. So the conclusion of this uh, short presentation is innovation is about connecting the dots. <coughs> but for connecting the dots, you need the right tools and you need the right people around you. Therefore, you need the team effort of QGIS. Hackfests are great fun. So with buying, with purchasing the book, you will contribute to a fund that allows me to bring students to these Hackfests. Hackfest also have a presentation uh, part where you can uh, share your, uh, your findings, academic findings, but then also you can participate in Hackfest to contribute to the product. It's a great tool for hydrology. I hope I have convinced you with this, just a few slides. And uh, yeah, join the community. And we are a certified institute. So all the participants who make it to the end get the official QGIS certificate. Uh, we pay that for them and it's uh, our contribution to QGIS. It, uh, it's 20 euros per certificate, 100% of that amount is used to further improve the software. So you see all these win-win business models. We can say we are a certified organization, QGS gets money to improve, and the students are happy because they have an official certificate. Okay, I hope this was a bit inspiring, but I'm sure that uh, uh, Kurt, Kurt Menke, who came all the way from the US for, uh, for the course, and also for this book presentation, uh, <coughs> you can tell a bit more about the community. So Hans asked me to say a few words about the QGIS community to introduce people what that is like um, if you don't already know. And uh, before I do that, I have a couple shameless plugs. So Hans talked about his journey over um, the years getting into open source. I'm just going to, my journey I'm going to talk about is just this year. Um, before, this, this is about a book launch for our QGIS for hydrological applications. But before that, I this winter wrote this book, Discover QGIS, which is a 400-page workbook for the classroom. It's a much more general treatment of QGIS. And um, so I have a shameless plug for that. I'm also donating a copy of this book to the IHE Delft Library tonight so that students here will have access to it. And I'll have a couple copies downstairs too. Um, and so, you know, Hans talked about using open source in education. And uh, the other software that shall not be named 
It also is, is prevalent at most colleges and universities around the world. My hope with this book is that instructors and professors can use this to start incorporating QGIS into their curriculum when they're teaching about GIS. It's also good for self-study, so um, I had to mention that. Um, I have one more shameless plug, I apologize, but um, while I'm here in the Netherlands, I'm teaching a master class Monday, thanks to Eric Muirberg for organizing it. Um, so I'm going to be teaching a workshop on cartographic skills. One of the funnest part of QGIS is kind of geeking out on all the crazy things you can do styling data with it. It's quite powerful. It's an amazing piece of software just for creating visualization. So we're going to, on Monday, if you're interested, there's still a few seats. You're going to do fun things like Tanaka contours up here, uh, Lego maps, kind of silly things, but also animating mesh data like Hans showed um, in his previous thing. Um, animating temporal data with time manager and doing lots of cool things so if you're interested it'll be a full day and um, you can talk to me later or, or eric later about how to sign up for that so with those out of the way um, i want to talk about the community so qgis is obviously a piece of software but it is also a vibrant welcoming community and i think I love the software and I love the community even more. It's really one of the aspects of the whole project um, that just keeps me um, engaged and wanting to come back for more. This is a photograph of the user conference and Hackfest in Acaruña in March where Hans and I kind of finalized our plans to write the book that we're launching tonight. So what makes QGIS a success? It's the people. It truly is. There's, you know, uh, people not familiar with open source will often assume that there's some kind of for-profit corporation behind a software like QGIS, but there is no corporation behind QGIS. It's a community, grassroots, developed piece of software. So everyone in here who has downloaded QGIS and started working with it, you are now part of the QGIS community. So it's, it's you as a user and, and a contributor to the project um, that really drives QGIS forward and makes it what it is. Um, with the internet, we're all over the world, but we can collaborate together from far away. So QGIS is truly a team effort. There's a lot of things, um, a lot of ways you can contribute. And one of the first ways you might think of, well, I'm not a C++ programmer, so how could I contribute to QGIS? Well, there's a lot of ways. I'm not going to go through them all. <laughs> but for example, QGIS is translated into, I don't know what the current count, I'm going to say it's about 42 languages these days. So you can actually put the interface into different languages. So there are people in um, different countries who have done that translation work. The documentation, if you, if you find something that could be improved, you can improve the documentation. That's an area that has a lot of needs writing books, writing plugins, uh, teaching, all there, there's so many ways. And then there's a lot of things, you know, behind the scenes that are terribly, you know, take a lot of work. Um, packaging up QGIS every four months for Mac and Linux and Windows, um, they're, they're, and people who are maintaining the website. All, all these things are, are pieces that need to be worked on and make QGIS what it is. So just to kind of put a face to this community, here are some pictures of some of the more um, prominent members of the QGIS community. Um, so it's, it's a, a very diverse group of people from all over the world. So these are people who you can approach, you can ask questions. So if you, I, I recommend everyone come to a Hackfest and um, meet people. That's one of the great things about open source that you don't get with proprietary software is you can actually sit down over a cup of coffee and talk to a developer and if you have an idea or if you want to contribute they will you know try to help mentor you and things like that you can ask some questions so QGIS as an organization operates like a democracy there is um, a formal steering committee and a chair of the project who you know vote on issues 
to steer the project forward. Um, there are also, you know, the developers. And um, another way, well, I mean, I'll get to that in a second, but one of the blobs in here are QGIS user groups, which I'll talk about in a moment. So if you are part of an, a national QGIS user group, um, that user group will have one vote on issues around the QGIS project. So there's a lot of ways that you can plug in from um, lots of different directions. So the, the developer meetings, which get called Hackfests, and um, once a year also contributor meetings look like this, where sometimes in the evenings, you know, there's people playing games, enjoying good food, but sitting around and, and working on the project, sharing their knowledge, um, fixing bugs, all the things that have to happen. Some more shots. Um, this was the first one I went to in Notabo in 2015. Um, it's a, it was a fantastic experience and it was transformative for me and I've been trying to go to as many as I can ever since. They're usually a long trip for me being based in the United States, but it's well worth it. <coughs> so the QGIS user groups. Um, this is one of the first ways that people can start engaging. Um, they, these are the countries that have active user groups right now. So if you're from a country that isn't green on the map, you could start a QGIS user group in your country. And so why would you do that? Well, there, there's, um, it kind of allows you to organize user meetings with your community and share knowledge, um, get together on some regular basis and you know, show each other how to do things that you've learned. Um, maybe inform people about what's going on with QGIS.org worldwide at a meeting. Um, organize crowdfunding events. Some larger na national QGIS user groups are raise funds within their country and actually sponsor the project financially. Um, this is Anita Grazer here from Austria. And uh, she said this, uh, at least, I don't know if she's the first one to say it, but she's the first one I heard say it. So uh, I put her picture up there. She said QGIS is a duocracy. And so what that means is if there's something, if you get into QGIS and you say, oh, I wish it did this, instead of just complaining, you can actually be empowered and do something about it. You can contact a developer and ask them how much that would cost to develop the new feature. If you can't afford it, you can develop a crowdfunding campaign to pay for it. If you actually can code, you could build it yourself. Um, and you could probably get mentored along the way um, and so one of the first experiences I had with this was uh, this little animation that's playing is a, a raster data set and we don't need to worry about what that is. But this is showing vegetation types and I work a lot with this kind of data. And there a few years ago, there wasn't a convenient way to, for QGIS to render that and symbolize it and make it look nice. And um, so myself and several users on the listserv found each other. And one of the developers said, you guys should all get together scope this out and ask someone what it would cost. And so we did that and to make a long story short, we ended up funding it collectively amongst about eight organizations, this new feature. And within three weeks, this was in the nightly build of QGIS and is now a, a feature that was actually used this week in our QGIS for hydrological applications course by our students. Um, so you can, you can make changes to the software if you need to. And I think that's one of the keys to <coughs> the dynamic of working in open source. So I encourage everyone to follow QGIS. Um, you can get onto Twitter and follow QGIS feeds on Twitter, both the official QGIS account and also QGIS users, um, GitHub, um, or better, just be part of QGIS yourself. So um, think about how you can contribute because we can all be users but it's important for everyone to, you know, at some point find a way to give back in some way, even if it's just, you know, organizing a small local meeting in your community. But, you know, coming together, that's what makes QGIS what it is. So that's my um, getting off my, my soapbox, as we say in America, for um, talking about the QGIS community. And now I have a little <laughs> surprise for my co-author. Hans, you want to come up here for a minute? <laughs> So this is where I live. This is the United States. 
and I'm, or I, I call it North America these days, I think that's better. Um, we, this is my state, New Mexico, and um, anyone who watches TV may know Breaking Bad. That is affiliated with my town worldwide. It's, it's for better or for worse. Uh, I live in the town where that was filmed. And um, in my state, it's a rural state with desert and high mountains, and there's a lot of um, Native American reservations and pueblos in my state. Within an hour's drive of my house, there are 16 um, American Indian nations, sovereign nations. So it's a big part of where I live, um, the, the American Indian culture. So there's one tribe here, Zuni Pueblo, about a two hour drive west of us. And um, they have a beautiful reservation on the border with Arizona. Uh, this is what it looks like there. And they make these things called Zuni Pueblo fetishes. And these fetishes are small carvings, usually made from onyx and inlaid with turquoise and things like that. And they're of individual animals. And so these animals are believed to have kind of powers that will help the owner of these little fetishes. <laughs> so I brought one for Hans. Thanks so much. You can open it. Very curious. It's, it's not a real fancy packing job, but it had to travel 11 hours by air, so. <laughs> wow, beautiful. So this is what he is opening up. Does anyone recognize what this is? It's, it's, it's a beaver. So if you're not familiar with what beavers are, beavers are water engineers. They, they, they cut down trees, they build dams. And so what could be more appropriate as a spirit animal for Hans? Thank you, George. Thank you, Kurt. That was great and inspiring, and I hope a lot of people got an insight in how QGIS works and that you can really be part of it. Now we move a bit to the official uh, part of this uh, uh, book launch. So I'm going to... Uh, I, I, I was looking for somebody to take the first book, and since we are an international institute in water, and it's about data, about dealing with data, I thought, okay, it might be good to look at Netherlands Space Office, where Ruud Grim is working, he's a senior policy advisor and he runs a very nice program on using geo-information for water and agriculture. And uh, I was very happy that Ruud uh, responded very positively to my request to, uh, for me to hand over the first symbolic book to him uh, today. So I would like to ask him forward to receive the first book and then he will present also something about, uh, sorry, about, <laughs> about NSO's work. We're going to use it and spread the word about the good things to do with data and uh, open source software. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just for your information, the Netherlands Space Office is part of the Dutch government, so we are dealing with everything which is related to space, satellites, and with all the data that is coming down from it. Um, actually, um, we are talking about water. And uh, when I was listening to your presentation, I remember there was a time that I was also in academics and I was doing a PhD and I was looking at water in inter interstellar objects with telescopes. So these are great astronomy, but I'm not an astronomer, I'm a, I'm a physicist. And I did uh, some experiments in the laboratory. So we put uh, water on a very cold piece of metal. We put all some other ingredients on it and we put a lot of UV on it. The nice thing that you, one of the elements that you get then uh, speaking about the cooking recipe, was alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> so, so what we were doing at that time was trying to understand uh, what was in effect was measured by astronomers in uh, in all kinds of uh, interstellar objects, but also on cometary ices to understand what is going on there and, and what kind of ingredients are there. And in effect, we were in effect building our cookbooks ourselves at that time. And I was also at that time programmer. Okay, later on I lost that skills, but uh, I think uh, I, I think it's very great that that this kind of initiatives are there, and, and that that is in fact, uh, in fact uh, enabling a lot of uh, yeah, science, but also I think a lot of uh, uh, yeah businesses doing uh, uh, making uh, applications that are really useful for society. Um, yeah, and that maybe brings me to 
the program that I'm coordinating. Uh, it's a program from uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign uh, Affairs. Um, let's say that we are doing a lot of great stuff with, uh, with satellites. And maybe we should put the presentation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so we have been working in, in, in space for a long time. We have the European Space Agency, we have NASA, and there is a lot of, let's say, satellites in, in orbit. And And the question was, we are working with all these satellites and a lot of data is being used for governments and maybe also for science, but our Ministry of Foreign Affairs just asked me a simple question. Of course, simple questions are very difficult to answer. Is how can we support smallholder farmers, food producers in developing countries? Okay, we did not really, let's say, how we could bridge the gap from, from that technology to the <coughs> livelihoods of smallholder farmers, but we, we decided to have a look into that. And in fact, out of this simple question, uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs said, okay, if you can develop a, a program that really helps uh, this type of uh, citizens, you, you can have some money and you can, let's say, initiate uh, uh, stimulate the development of services. So that's what we have done. So in fact the basis of, of our program is in fact the fact that the European Space Agency has three different types of satellites operational. Two are in orbit and one are on the ground. So if one fails they put very quickly the, the third one into orbit. And this is providing operational satellite data continuously. So that is very important because otherwise both the, yeah, the clients and uh, the Let's say the service providers are not both going to build uh, services and provide services in an operational manner. The European Commission said, okay, to stimulate that this data should be open and for free. So I, I don't know. Who of you are working anyway with maybe this type of data? Can, can you raise hands? Uh, not so much yet. Let's, let's see how it will, will come into the future. So on the right hand side, we, we have, in fact, uh, yeah, uh, let's say the beneficiary, the, user, the, the farmer in many developing countries is facing climate change, so all the conditions are, are going to differ. So all the traditional knowledge is, is not really uh, working anymore. So how can we help them? And, and what he needs is, in fact, more and uh, timely information, for instance, about the weather, but also Related to that, what is the best moment to provide uh, fertilizer or, or to put pesticides, or maybe even not to put pesticides because if they put it on uh, on their uh, plots, if there is a heavy rain shower coming in 48 hours, then all the, the pesticides uh, or fertilizers is lost and he loses also money. So there are different ways that you can help the farmer. But to bring <coughs> such an advice, it's maybe very simple by SMS or maybe by call center, there is a lot of technology behind it. And it starts with the satellite data, with other uh, geo data. There's a lot of technology in, in the cloud to process all this data, to do the agricultural modeling, and to, to, let's say, to change this information into an actionable advice for the farmer. So this is what we are bringing together in our program. All the different actors that are active let's say, on various specific elements, there's no single organization or company that really can run this, let's say, the whole information chain itself. So we are bringing that together in order also to, let's say, to engage with the farmers, you need organizations that uh, understand these farmers. So these are very often uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that have been working with these farmers for a long time but can also be extension officers from governments or from, let's say, large companies. So that is how you can understand what are what is needed, what, what is the farmer needed, but also to, to help them to engage with this new type of advice. So how does it work out? The program started about five years ago and actually the, the first projects are in fact now coming to an end. Um, we have 25 projects in 15 countries, and I will only give you three or four examples. In Uganda, uh, an insurance service is developed, uh, which in fact looks at a, a certain area, and if the, uh, the conditions are less favorable than the average over a certain period, 
then there is an automatic payout. So a farmer <coughs> subscribes via an insurance company, and if the conditions if the, 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 the are too, too low, they will get a partial or full payout. This is an, maybe this is also related to water. Uh, I, we, we call it also sometimes the Tom Tom for pastoralists, the navigation system. Uh, the, but the navigation system goes by uh, just by a call center. So a farmer is in, uh, sorry, a pastoralist is in an area where there's a shortage of water, which probably also <coughs> is indicating a shortage in vegetation. So they want to go to another area where there is enough vegetation and water available for the herds. But if you go from, from place A to place B in this straight line, you probably are going to cross agricultural zones. And if that is happening, I can tell you, I've, I was very surprised and also upset by it. Two years ago, in the summer period in Nigeria, 1,500 people died because of fights between farmers and pestilence. So it's not only, let's say, beneficiary because maybe you save, uh, let's say, the, the, the herds, but it also saves actually lives. So it's an, an aspect with it was, yeah, I was also very surprised with it. Um, a project in South Africa, um, where, where let's say the services provided by a, a partnership in which is includes uh, the local uh, meteorological office and a local <coughs> agricultural research uh, uh, center. They have been working together and providing now uh, services related to uh, weather information and uh, uh, some agricultural advices. And they have built an, a very large uh, IT infrastructure around it, and they are able to plug in in their app, let's say, a new decision rule every day when it comes up. So if, if I hear about your community that you're really rapidly developing, so what happens if you can connect, let's say, maybe your community to this kind of uh, development? I don't know. Then let's say a little bit the more difficult thing about this is that, let's say, there are, let's say, businesses involved, uh, there are a lot of cloud computing involved, and it costs money. And that is maybe different, maybe, from, uh, let's say, uh, when you're, let's say, working in, uh, let's say, in, in the academic uh, uh, area. So, what we are doing here is to, to keep the costs as low as possible, but still, there, let's say, the operations should be financed. So, there is, behind each product, there's a kind of creative, let's say, maybe business model you can follow, but anyway, there should be incomes that, let's say, finance the operations of these uh, services. But maybe this will inspire you, and maybe you come along uh, in your country similar activities, maybe you can think about, okay, how can we connect with maybe from the QGIS uh, community to this type of <coughs> development? I don't know, but maybe we hear, maybe few years from now. Thank you very much. And just to give you an, an illustration, um, I have time for that. Once. Yeah, yeah. Space is everywhere, and it's providing a new currency of information, satellite information, rapidly evolving to help solve planet-sized challenges like food security. It's changing the game. 70% of the world's food is provided by smallholder farmers. And in the face of climate change, with the number of global mouths to feed increasing, and our resources depleting, smallholder productivity is within all of our interests. Satellites and increasing connectivity are enabling transition from traditional agriculture to climate smart agriculture. New levels of information on climate-related challenges, such as flooding and droughts, combined with personalized details, crop type and scale, are boosting crop productivity. From pestilence to the most popular time to fertilize soil, satellites are changing farming, industries and lives. Space is not only an opportunity to make our planet future-proof, it's making farmers more resilient, changing sectors such as microcredit and insurance, 
offering scalable opportunities to business enterprises and investors. It's providing a paradigm shift. And the most exciting part, you can be involved. Join us in using the climate smart tools of today to ensure the food security of our world tomorrow. Thank you, Lute. I think uh, that was also very inspiring. Maybe our next book should be about uh, remote sensing for hydrological applications uh, using open source, of course, you know, and get involved in what we've seen. Let's see. Um, we're almost at the end, but there are a few more things. I would like to ask uh, the vice rector to come uh, to stage again because. Both Kurt and me, Kurt already said it, want to donate also a book to the library of IHG. Uh, the library couldn't be uh, present here. Yeah, and I'm happy to uh, take the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, I'm sure they will be uh, put to very good use. And, uh, I'm sure that it will be ha very hard to get uh, out of the library because constantly they will be probably borrowed down. <laughs> but, uh, okay, thank you, Hans. Okay, and then, um, so what the program is uh, now is uh, there will be an explanation on, uh, on Mapathons by, by Eric. I'll go forward in a bit, but it's better to explain the program now. Then we'll go down for uh, having uh, food and you can install yourselves and there will be volunteers around helping you with the Mapathon part. You can eat your food and have, have drinks there. Uh, you can also buy the books there. We got uh, uh, some, some boxes of books with us and you get a 40% discount uh, tonight on the book. So it's 20 euros you can pay in, in cash or uh, to... Uh, signed by the authors. And signed by the authors, yeah. It's a great occasion that we are both authors here. So uh, use that opportunity. Uh, I would like to call uh, Eric uh, Meerberg forward. Because he's not only going to present us uh, the Mapathon, instructions but uh, I also he also did something very nice for both Kurt and me uh, we also uh, know Eric of course from the, the open source scene he's a very uh, active open source what they say uh, engaging a lot of people in open source in the Netherlands and uh, he wrote this very nice foreword about the book and about us and uh, we really appreciate that and therefore of course we can give uh, Eric also one of the books Enjoy. And I'm, I'm really curious about this forward because normally when you write something for a publication of someone else, you get it back uh, asking, <laughs> could you please change this a bit? This might be a bit slightly off. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't get it back at <laughs> all. It was perfect. So I was wondering, did they just change my text? <laughs> I don't think so. There's always something wrong with it, especially if I write it. But it's um, yeah. okay. Enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> you want to use uh, my laptop for giving instructions? Yes, please. Well, I'll, I'll keep it very short yeah. because most of the people probably will know something about mapathons. I can browse your sunset with task Yeah, that's it. Um, and uh, uh, it, it is a very simple concept. The concept is that anyone here, everyone could be uh, a participant in OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap, you can edit OpenStreetMap for an area that you know very well. But there's uh, um, uh, some years ago uh, when the uh, Haiti earthquake came, uh, they, um, the whole uh, Hot OSM started. That's the humanitarian open street map team. And uh, they thought if we can get so many people after a disaster to help mapping, why not do it before the disaster strikes? So that is why the whole Hot OSM humanitarian open street map team got set up. Um, that evolved, and then at some point, uh, the Red Cross and um, the Médecins Sans Frontières. Uh, the Doctors Without Borders, they, uh, they join forces with Hot OSM in order to prepare uh, their field work with uh, OpenStreetMap. And that is what became known as uh, Missing Maps. So the Missing Maps project is what we're here for today. And uh, we do stuff for 
preparing uh, the, the field area for, uh, for a red cross. Or at least that is how it is always explained to me. But luckily there are a few people from the red, Dutch Red Cross here in the audience. And I heard that someone will explain it a lot better than I did. <laughs> it's Aga. In the meantime, I'm going to show you something here about, about uh, uh, the whole um, uh, idea. We have the task manager. There's a lot of tasks always available. And if you're there um, and you uh, go to start mapping, and then yes, of course, I can click this way. And you see there's always there's a, a high priority or low priority or and you see there there's a few things here like level um, and what campaign that is and who's asking uh, so for example here it is half itself that is asking well today we're going to work on a project and the project has this uh, beautiful name it's called 6755 <laughs> We're going back to where uh, whole Hotel was am started. We're going to uh, Haiti. Uh, the Netherlands Red Cross is the organization that's asking. And uh, I think I can give you something about Red Cross. Or maybe... I have just uh, one slide. You have one slide, bring so that, it on. That's about the, where we are going to map. And that is, okay, great. But am I, I allowed to use this on your computer? It's yeah, IHE. Yeah. It's an IHE one. Yeah. <laughs> While you're doing that, it might be good to mention that Agatha is an uh, alumna at uh, IHG Delft, graduated uh, last year, if I'm right, and she works now this year. Uh, this year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, works now for uh, 510 Global uh, GIS <coughs> part, uh, I summarize it, uh, of uh, the Red Cross. So, great yeah. for us to get to know. I think you said everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to I think this is okay. This is just this one. I'll just run it straight from you. But yeah, I didn't. <laughs> okay, that's not. Must be, must I'll, be I'll just leave it on. I think it's yeah. okay like this, but no, there it is. It is there. Half a mile. Okay, yeah, that's better. Yeah. And then, run it. <laughs> no. Yes. 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 Got it. <laughs> but I think it, you you say mostly uh, everything. So yeah, I'm a uh, I'm Agat. I'm uh, also former uh, uh, IHE uh, student in hydrology and water resources. And um, yeah, so um, like why we are like so five ten uh, global. Uh, it's also one team of uh, the Netherlands Red Cross, and uh, we are uh, have been in uh, like focusing in data and uh, digital, um, and we help uh, other um, Red Cross uh, society in the world uh, to uh, reduce the impact of uh, disaster, and uh, especially the impact on the most vulnerable people. So today, what we are going to do is work on uh, Haiti and on. Um, project uh, focusing on the Artibonite River. Uh, so it's this catchment, so I don't have maybe yeah. And that's uh, this uh, big catchment uh, here. Um, basically this area, it's um, really at a lot of uh, flood risk. So you have a lot of different flood happening. You can have a uh, flood coming from the coast. Also, flash flood coming from the, the side of the basin, uh, riverine uh, floods happening, but also we have a dam here, and then uh, this uh, dam uh, can also break, so we could have a um, risk of so dam break. <laughs> yeah. And so also overflow <laughs> of uh, this dam, so that's why this area is really uh, of our interest. And in this area, we focus for tonight uh, on this. Uh, the, up, the downstream part of uh, the catchment where actually all the risks are combined here. So I think, yeah, that's the most thing and why uh, Mapaton, as you explained, for Red Cross it's uh, really uh, important for Red Cross in Haiti to work on the disaster risk management. So the first part, like prevention, uh, prepare, disaster preparedness. Uh, and they want to implement in this area an early warning, early action. So to be able to know uh, who is at risk, where, where which person are uh, most vulnerable, and uh, what to do if we know that a cyclone, for instance, comes. 
we need to know where people live and what are the main infrastructure. And also for disaster response, because if we have all the world there, then they will also know um, where uh, to send emergency um, teams and what are the best access. Yeah, so I think that's... So basically, just one, one thing, if, if people don't know what 510 is, why is it called 510? Uh, that's uh, for the uh, land, uh, like the Earth area. Yeah. And the 510 global team can always use extra help, right? They, if, if, yeah. if somebody finishes mm -hmm. studies here and is still here but doesn't have a job yet and has got yeah. a few months to spare uh, <laughs> while, while doing it, we also, come, yeah, especially we the people who are good at GIS and at data. Yeah, we always need the volunteer yeah. to help. So. And they use open source. Yes, yes you learn a lot there. Yes. Thanks, I got it. Um, going back to this one. Uh, we, uh, so we are mapping this project, and whenever you map a project like this, there's a, there's a few um, simple things to know. And I cannot find them here for some... Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, that's just one step. I have to click it first, sorry. I thought I was already there. And you've got a nice overview of the project. It says uh, what will be happening there. And here you see a couple of tabs. And one is the instructions. And those are extremely important because in the instructions, um, well, there are the instructions on what to map and how to map them. So, um, as a... Uh, Dutch male person, I find it extremely hard to read instructions and to follow them. <laughs> but in this case, it is really important. Even I read them here. Because it is here it says, for this task, we have to do buildings. Simply trace the outline to all buildings. But a building should also be tagged. It should be tagged as a building of type building. There are a lot of types in buildings like schools, um, well, any, any, uh, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> a lot of them, like farms, shops, uh, well, yeah. But the thing is, you cannot see that from the air, or most of the time you cannot see it. So just make it a building. That's an important thing. Another thing is, make sure you square the corners of the building. Most of the buildings tend to be square. Sometimes they're round, sometimes they're really weird shapes, but most of them tend to be square, so please square them. The <coughs> um, one important function is that even if you think a building is not square, but it, it's a bit like this, if a lot of buildings are like that on the map and they all differ, it looks terrible and people don't trust the map anymore. So please square the buildings. It's just marketing. <laughs> okay, another thing is uh, missing roads. Main roads are already on the map, and etc. And, it, and for uh, this place, um, uh, if waterways are not well mapped or not mapped at all, add them to the map. But those are the th things we do: buildings, roads, waterways. Now there are loads of other things you can map. And you're allowed to do so because it's a free world and it's an open map. But for this project, those three things are important and no other. So if you want to um, really help with this project, please stick to these guidelines. Now, and then um, uh, you see here, you see an overview of the area. So this is the, uh, the uh, lower river area here. And you just click on a, on a square or you and then it's oh this was a day ago yep um, I'm so confused by this layout of the laptop you just click on one and you say start mapping but there's no start mapping map bottom of the map yeah that demonstrating in your laptop, this will be a lot better. Uh, there should be a uh, <coughs> a start mapping thing here. 
I'm not so sure why this isn't happening. But anyway, normally you would just like start mapping now and it would go. So, <laughs> luckily, there's a good instruction leaflets as well on the table. Raymond, where did I go wrong here? Yeah. I don't know. Can I you did. Take one advance. Maybe it's under there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, it's a good thing, but oh no, it's view, view, thing. Cool. Yeah. Should be here. Maybe refresh. Oh no, I'm hey, I'm, I'm logged on. Maybe I thought I wasn't logged on. I have to say today. I don't know why. There's a, there's an exclamation mark there. Here's something. Okay. Maybe I'm blocked. Yeah, yeah. I think that. <laughs> well, I wanted to keep. I wanted to just show you that you could come into the editor then, but that will work out while we go. So maybe you just show on the street map without the, the task uh, rectangle and just demonstrate the, uh, how it looks in OpenStreet. Just go to OpenStreetMap and do some editing, okay. some random area or in IT. Yep. Uh, but yeah, this is different. Well, but it, it, at least it is. Uh, oh, I know this area. <laughs> <laughs> we were there. Right here. We were there. Yeah. I just heard that. They, were, they shared an apartment sometime, uh, or, or a room in, in, uh, in the office building. Uh, we shared an apartment last month uh, that was nearby here. We could edit that apartment and say it's a very nice one, it was somewhere in this building. So we could log in here and um, start editing. And what we do is we use the ID in browser editor. That's the simplest editor. thing. And there you see, you immediately get a, an uh, aerial picture. And from the aerial picture, you can see what is going on here. And you see, it's, it's a bit, it looks a bit strange. You have to get used to this view. But you could see, for example, here that the building here, here is there some open space in it. So you could edit that and you could change that here. This is um, uh, for, uh, uh, I'm not going to change uh, Bucharest. That I don't think they would like that, uh, but this is um, this is what happens. This is the main interface. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. I think uh, everything becomes more clear if we start working with yeah. it. And if we have some food, so I would like to invite you to go down to the restaurant and uh, get some food, get it installed. The volunteers will be around. We install ourselves with the books. You can pass by. For the food. There will be also alumni uh, online, hopefully, in mapping with us. Enjoy. Happy mapping. Happy mapping.